the process of genetic engineering, as we said, created massive collateral damage. So the Roundup Ready corn had higher levels of putrescine and cadaverine responsible for the foul odor of rotting dead bodies linked to cancer and allergies. But ultimately, it was a lot worse. Animal feeding studies, human uh, reports, clinical experience, and now we understand more the modes of action linked these foods to digestive disorders, fatigue, anxiety, depression, brain fog, hypertension, autism, all sorts of cancers, um, uh, Parkinson's, uh, Alzheimer's, diabetes, basically all of the major diseases we're experiencing. Welcome to Care More, Be Better, a podcast for people like you who care about the social impact of conscious companies and everyday heroes. Hear inspiring stories from those who put people and planet before profit and personal gain. You'll learn how you can make a difference, vote with your dollars, and get involved today. Here's your host, Karina Belizzi. Hello, fellow Jupiters and friends. I'm your host, Karina Belizzi. Today, we're going to talk about all things related to GMOs, otherwise known as genetically modified organisms. Foods, really. Given recent advents with CRISPR technologies, the entire landscape of GMOs and genetic engineering as a whole has really changed and continues to change day by day. Many are calling this new landscape GMO 2.0. So to navigate these murky waters and help us all understand the risks associated with GMOs and the genetic engineering of our natural world, I'm joined by Jeffrey Smith. As a global thought leader on GMOs for over 27 years, Jeffrey has authored two bestsellers, directed five documentaries, delivered over 2,000 lectures and interviews in 45 different countries trained 1,500 speakers, and organized more than 10,000 grassroots advocates. Jeffrey's meticulous research has been presented at medical conferences and inspired thousands to prescribe non-GMO and organic diets. Wow. Jeffrey Smith, welcome to the show. Thank you. Great to be here, Karina. Well, as we get our start, I just have to say it was really amazing to be at an event with you, the Soil and Health Fair Forum up in Petaluma and um, be able to see so many people come together and talk about these important issues. And I just have to say, I'm completely blown away by this upswelling of activists in our local area in Northern California. But overall, I want to be just really express my thanks to you for operating as the MC that day. You did a fantastic job. Thank you. Thank you. I was very impressed with the quality of the uh, speakers, as I like to say, there was a lot of facts per minute and a very relevant fact. So I, I think that was a great, a great uh, conference. I think sometimes these efforts are really, they just show their best face through these kind of local grassroots events like this one. So part of the reason I was so excited to invite you here today is to really help our audience understand why GMOs piss me off so much, because I feel like a lot of the time I'm even driven to this moment of some complacency because there's so little understanding by the part of people who don't spend their time really digging into the science of what GMOs are and what CRISPR technologies do and how genetic engineering impacts our foods. And also, then there are these really prominent figures out there who will make statements about GMOs like they're nothing to be worried about. One example comes to mind from someone I respect, and that's Neil deGrasse Tyson. I mean, he knows a lot about space, not so much about the inner space of our bodies and how foods affect them from what I've seen. And so he'll make a comment about GMOs and make it seem like it's nothing to be feared at all. And why are all us, you know, people in the natural products industry all up in arms about these things? So my hope as we get started is that you could help this audience understand what GMOs are and why there's something to be concerned about. You know, I was aware of Neil deGrasse Tyson's comment and uh, I responded to it. And I think I might've mentioned that geneticist David Suzuki said that any 
one that says that GMOs are safe is either intentionally lying or stupid, and that I would give Neil deGrasse Tyson the benefit of the doubt <laughs> without saying which one that meant. Yeah, he, he certainly blew it when he tried to come in outside of his area of expertise. Um, but the thing is, there's a lot of reasons why someone might think it's safe. For example, if they read the FDA policy, which is in place today, and it was uh, published in 1992, it says the agency is not aware of any information showing that foods created by these new methods differ from other foods in any meaningful or uniform way. So if there's no difference, there was no need for testing, no need for labeling, and that's why the FDA policy was and is that companies like Monsanto can put their foods on the market without even telling the FDA, or they can participate in a meaningless exercise of a voluntary consultation process, at the end of which they get a letter reminding them that it's their responsibility to determine if their foods are safe, not the FDA's. Now, if we were to think that the FDA policy was based on science, then of course there's no difference. And that in fact is the basis of the entire government policy on GMOs. And it's a lie, it's fraud. We know because of documents made public from a lawsuit seven years after the policy was in place, that it was exactly the opposite of the overwhelming consensus among the scientists working at the FDA. That they had said that the process of GMOs and natural breeding are different and lead to different risks and highlighted the possibility of allergens, toxins, new diseases and nutritional problems, encouraged the policy to include human toxicological studies among others, and all of it was ignored and the existence of their concerns was denied in the policy that said, we're not aware of any information showing that the foods are different. On the basis of that fraud, GMOs were put into the food supply to such an extent that the average American eats more than their weight in GMOs per year, and we believe it is contributing to more than 40 diseases, not just in a minor way, but millions upon millions of people are suffering from diseases needlessly, which we think are either created or exacerbated by the GMOs or the Roundup herbicide that is sprayed on most GMOs. So I'm thinking that many people in the audience that aren't aware of that may want to know which diseases and what the evidence is. And I'm happy to share that information. But actually, with the current GMOs 2.0, it gets even worse. Well, let's talk first about the difference between where we've been, which is that standard GMOs that got us into the world where we even needed a non-GMO project with that butterfly on the seal, because guess what? Flocks of monarch butterflies were just dying off because of corn that was genetically engineered to contain glyphosate. So that was 1.0, right? First problem. What is different about 2.0? The 1.0, Monsanto was selling Roundup and it was very profitable. And the chief poison in Roundup was, is glyphosate. And it was patented by Monsanto. It was originally patented as a descaler to clean industrial boilers and pipes because it grabbed onto minerals and pulled them off. And then when it was spilled on the ground, it killed plants. So Monsanto bought the molecule, patented it, and put it into Roundup. But in 2000, the patent was going to expire. So they found some bacteria growing in a chemical waste dump in the presence of Roundup, not dying. And Roundup is an antibiotic. It usually kills a lot of bacteria. And they figured, great, let's put it in the food supply. So they took a gene that produced the ability for the bacteria to survive, and they put it into soy and corn and cotton and canola and now sugar beets and alfalfa. Now, to put it in there, they would take a gene gun with millions of particles of tungsten or gold and coat it in this complex gen this gene complex and shoot it into a plate of cells, hoping that it gets into the DNA of some of those cells, or they would 
equip bacteria to smuggle it in. Now, they didn't know where in the DNA it ended up. They didn't know what kind of collateral damage occurred in the DNA, causing all sorts of changes, which are substantial and have later been verified. But when they clone those cells into a plant, now that plant had that little bacterial DNA gene in every cell, allowing the plant not to die when sprayed with Roundup herbicide. So they called it Roundup Ready. So essentially, it was a way for farmers to weed more easily. So they can spray right over the top of the food crops their glyphosate-based herbicide, killing all of the other plant biodiversity, which weeds, and not kill the genetically engineered Roundup Ready crops. But when a farmer bought the seeds, he or she would sign a contract that they would only use Monsanto's version and not the knockoffs later made by China after the patent expired. So it was a way of selling more herbicide. Now, the process of genetic engineering, as we said, created massive collateral damage. So the Roundup Ready corn had higher levels of putrescine and cadaverine responsible for the foul odor of rotting dead bodies linked to cancer and allergies. But ultimately, it was a lot worse. Animal feeding studies, human uh, reports, clinical experience, and now we understand more the modes of action, linked these foods to digestive disorders, fatigue, anxiety, depression, brain fog, hypertension, autism, all sorts of cancers, um, uh, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, uh, diabetes, basically all of the major diseases we're experiencing. And we could identify, it could be the GMO itself and the changes that occur. It could be the Roundup, which when it gets sprayed on the crop, it gets absorbed into the crop most of it moves, or a lot of it moves into the food portion, can't wash it off, it's inside there, and we eat it. And there's also certain crops that produce their own insecticide that kills insects, and that also can have a negative effect on human beings as well. So between these three things, we think that it's clobbering our health, and we have plenty of evidence, enough to convince scientists and physicians to say this is dangerous and should never have been approved. Now, there is a new way of creating GMOs, gene editing. Most people have heard of CRISPR. It's touted as a possible technology to help fix defective genes in humans. And that may be possible in the future. But right now, according to the prominent science journal called Nature, the outcome of three CRISPR experiments on human embryos showed, show, showed so much side effects that it was described as chromosomal mayhem. You can end up with added genes, deleted genes, scrambled genes, mutations up and down the DNA. And some of these also have inheritable changes in gene expression called epigenetic effects. Essentially, it wasn't ready for prime time. Now, it turns out that the biotech industry is in the habit of lying. We talked about one big fraud. Uh, we've documented so much evidence about Monsanto lying. Maybe, maybe they're editing and, the truth. <laughs> uh, they're lying by omission. I talked to a former Monsanto scientist. Yeah, I, I talked know. to a former Monsanto scientist who said that they genetically engineered corn and fed it to rats and the rats showed significant problems instead of withdrawing the corn they rewrote the study to hide the effects so yeah they edited it or uh someone i debated on the on the tv show the doctors and then later documents were paid, made public from a lawsuit she ghost wrote a paper where she took out the link between glyphosate and miscarriages and took her name off of the paper 
and Monsanto's name off the paper. So yes, editing. So we'll call it editing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I wasn't editing. trying to make it lighter. I guess the joke is that we're gene editing and we're also comfortable editing the truth here to to make it marketable is essentially where we're at, right? And now, I mean, even even if we look at Monsanto, Monsanto got such a bad name that Bayer or Bayer, depending on where you live in the world, how you pronounce that name, they bought Monsanto and put to bed the name of Monsanto. I recently got to speak with Kelly Ryerson, who is also colloquially known as the glyphosate girl and um, on my po other podcast, Nutrition Without Compromise. And she talked about the fact that, you know, as soon as Bayer bought that company, they were taking down the Monsanto sign within minutes. And I believe that because of how bad of a reputation Monsanto got. People in my industry, the natural products industry, colloquially referred to them as Monsatan. I mean, and broadly, because of the fact that there was so much that was hidden from the public actively and that was actively lobbied in Congress to get, you know, some of these approvals kind of ramrodded through so there weren't environmental protections to prevent them from being able to do what they do which is just deplorable. It's a la Mon Satan. <laughs> and now Bayer continues that tradition. And they and others have lied to governments very effectively, claiming that the same technology which causes chromosomal mayhem and could kill people if it was tried at this point using gene therapy based on the side effects, should be completely deregulated when creating genetically engineered plants, animals, or microbes. And they have succeeded in the United States, Canada, uh, England, in Japan, in India, in Australia, in Brazil, in Argentina, that either plants or animals or microbes or a combination are now allowed to be gene edited by a technology that creates massive collateral damage and released into the environment or into the food supply. So there's a company called Conscious Foods, which is gen gene editing mustards and, and, and salad greens and selling it to restaurants and catering organizations so that we don't even know that it's genetically engineered and they're not doing any safety studies. And some of these companies are calling it non-GMO, pretending that it's non-GMO because they're not putting genes from other species into it which then creates a, the government then turns a blind eye and says, well, we don't care because there's no trans genes, transfer of genes from one to another. And they're ignoring the fact that the process can create allergens or toxins or carcinogens or anti-nutrients in the food. So what this means is if you want to get a CRISPR lab yourself, which the basic is less than $2,000, you can create genetically engineered organisms and put them in the environment and put them in the food supply. And there's no one telling you you can't. And there's no one telling you that you have to label it or have a specific uh, safety assessment. Now, certain ones do require labeling if you have a certain number of dollars you're selling. But essentially, it's if you sell it to a restaurant or a catering organization, it's a loophole for labeling. Now, now our, our what this means is... I'm just wanting to bring up a couple of examples that um, people might remember that were somewhat entertaining. If you happen to have watched The Daily Show when Jon Stewart hosted it, he had this somewhat recurring um, bit that was, what are they doing to pigs? And in one of them, they were gene editing a pig to produce more omega-3 so you could get healthy bacon, right? Sounds on the surface like that could be interesting, right? Another was actually gene editing in a radioactive isotope, which actually made the pigs glow in the dark. So, you know, these might sound like cute little antidotes at the, at the onset, but they are practices by which you can, you know, insert genes from a plant into an animal, from an animal into a plant. You can make a tomato that is less likely to bruise by inserting frog DNA. That has been done. So even the question then becomes of what is really a responsible product from a vegetarian standpoint. So if you are a vegan or vegetarian and you're not buying purely organic, you could be getting this mis mistreatment to animals from just a tomato that you'd buy on the market. 
You know, when I was on The Daily Show, I talked about a genetically engineered potato. And a couple, few years later, the, pe the person that created that potato, who retired, he worked first for Monsanto and then the big potato company, J.R. Simplot, which produced the potato. He wrote a book saying it was the worst GMO. He described in page after page how this genetically engineered potato that he designed could create disease, death, and environmental problems. And he hadn't paid any attention to these things when he was working in the industry. It was only after he retired. I suspect he read some of my work because when I read the, the book, I was like, whoa, I think I wrote that. <laughs> and he did some interviews and then all of a sudden just stopped talking about it because uh, apparently he was you know, threatened. But it's an example. And in that particular potato, the potato was designed not to turn brown when sliced. And so it had a gene in it that silenced, I mean, a, a gene in the DNA of the potato that silenced another gene that produced the browning. Now, one of the many things that could go wrong is that if we eat the potato, that gene may silence and reprogram our gene expression. And that could be catastrophic. And it's just one of many things that could go wrong. So coming back to the GMO 2.0, the biotech industry has convinced governments that gene editing is safe, precise, and even natural and does not have to be regulated. Now, what is gene editing? Well, let's talk about CRISPR. In the past, to genetic engineer, you'd blast things in with a gene gun or you'd smuggle them in with bacteria. Here you insert a molecular scissors and a guide to tell the scissors where along the DNA it should cut. It can cut in many places it's not intended to. That's called off-target effects. And wherever it cuts, when the DNA repair mechanism comes out from the cell to fix this emergency, it can create all sorts of massive problems. It can cause DNA that happens to be in the Petri dish from another animal or from the, from the bacteria that was used to insert the, the molecular scissors. That can be stuffed in. It can cause deletions and additions and mutations, et cetera. Well, that sounds like we're and, watching the fly oh, now, like Jeff Goldblum. Exactly. And all, and the thing is, all of that's been de deregulated. So it's an absolute disaster waiting to happen in our food supply. But here's the thing. It gets worse. It is so easy now to create GMOs with CRISPR that we're in a gene rush. All of these different companies, entrepreneurs, academics, they're looking to get their patented GMO out on the market quickly in order to make a lot of money and fix something. So everything that they want to change in nature, you know, there's a discussion for years about genetically engineering out the mothering instinct of livestock. So you don't, they don't care if their children are taken from them upon birth. There's genetically engineering livestock so that they don't have horns, so you don't have to dehorn them. You can put them together close in, 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 in factory farms. And they tried that, and it ended up creating bacteria genes in the cows that they didn't even know for two and a half years. And they discovered accidentally afterwards and had to kill all the cows that they were creating. But essentially, everything with DNA is targetable and being targeted more and more. Insects, trees, grass, livestock, pets fish. So we can, in this generation, replace nature. Because when you release them into the environment, these organisms, which have new, new DNA, new behaviors, new composition, are unrecallable. They self-propagate and corrupt the gene pool and ultimately end biological evolution as we know it and create a combo pack of the products of the billions of years of evolution, along with the products of lab techniques prone to side effects. And that's what we're foisting on future generations. Well, and I so have it's... to comment on this too, because I recently got to interview Simon Setra, who wrote this incredible book called The New Fish, 
the reason he called that the new fish, you would guess, has something to do with selecting a specific species that you've manipulated quite a bit to then propagate as a salmon that's farmed from a, a scale that is just unfathomable to most people and which has weakened wild fish populations because there's always escape. And when those fish escape, even if they might outcompete the wild variant and how quickly they can grow, they don't outcompete them in their strength. They don't outcompete them in their ability to combat regular diseases they might confront. And they don't know how to go upstream to their spawning grounds. And so you end up with a fish that isn't coming in and bringing nutrients from the sea into the uh, riverbeds. You end up with weakened populations. And now in a situation where he stated on this podcast that where before you might have had millions of salmon in the rivers of Norway, now you might be able to fill two entire of those sea net pens with wild fish where there are thousands of them that contain farmed fish. So it's so devastated the wild fish populations that he, as an adult in his thirties, maybe forties, I didn't quite ask him his age, but you know, maybe a little younger than me. He said he's never consumed wild salmon. He's Norwegian. What the heck, you know? And I would say the F word, I but I'm actually... trying to keep this relatively clean. I can see that and raise you. <laughs> so they're talking about a not a genetically engineered uh, salmon at this point, but uh, what what he's talking about because that hasn't been released in these. So the Frankenfish has not been released. I wasn't actually sure. Right. On that. Well, there. Yeah, that's we we we're pretty confident that Aqua Bounty, which has the genetically engineered variety, which grows more quickly because they insert genes from other fish to keep the growth hormone going year round. Usually it shuts down for part of the year, but it pushes the growth hormone. So it's growing and growing and growing and growing and it's supposed to get to market in, uh, in less time. Now, some Canadian researchers did the same type of genetic engineering with salmon and tested the salmon in a bunch of tanks. And when they fed enough food to the salmon, to the genetically engineered salmon, no problem. But when they reduce the amount of food, these are voracious fish, so hungry because they're growing, they got aggressive, cannibalized, killed off other fish, whether it was other genetically engineered fish in the tank or, or natural fish. So every tank that they did an experiment on, it caused a, a reduction or collapse or an extinction of the population. And the tanks were designed to look like the ocean, and they became much more aggressive going into areas that the natural salmon did not. So if you imagine if they escape, you have these gangs of genetically engineered frankenfish going out and killing off competitors and essentially possibly taking over the niche from natural. Now, is it possible to take over the niche? There was a computer generated uh, program where they found that a Japanese fish called the Madaka had a 30% reduction in its, in its tendency for viable offspring. And they, in the computer generated model, they put 60 fish in a population of 60,000 and ran it. And in 40 generations, it was extinct. And this is something that could happen in the, in the wild. So you can wipe out salmon or you can wipe out other things. And they're creating these um, eggs and supposedly going to be bringing the eggs to, an, to a um, landlocked tank to grow. But once they're approved and out there, there's no laws against it being sold to developing countries where they'll just put it in fish farms. And fish farms, I think there was a mi 2 million released in per year uh, from these fish farms because of, you know, broken nets and and, yeah, and escape is unavoidable. Surges. You just can't, so, you, you can't engineer away from that. And, um, yeah, and like the guys real. that created the genetically engineered mosquito, uh, I was talking to one of the chief scientists, he says, oh, it won't change the gene pool, all the mosquitoes die. Well, three years after they released it in Brazil, it changed the, the gene pool of mosquitoes there forever. Completely exactly the opposite of what he promised me as we were both uh, testifying for or against the genetically engineered mosquito. So it's an example of 
basically we've arrived at this time in human civilization where we can on purpose or by accident redirect the streams of evolution for all time irreversibly permanently and that the folly of this new technology unregulated could be foisted upon every future generation and the example that i like to use because it's so obvious and easy 24 rabbits were introduced in 1859 into australia so that visitors would feel more comfortable because they get to hunt rabbits like they did in the uk well rabbits multiply like rabbits and by 1920s there was about 10 billion of them because there was no natural predator and it destroyed and changed the entire landscape and ecology so well, and then gene people put up the uh, rabbit-proof fences, which disrupted yes. the migratory path of wild animals and resulted in some of them, you know, basically dying from dehydration because they couldn't get to their water sources. So the unintended consequences were quite large. And this is what happens every time the human species gets involved with deciding that they're going to disrupt how something occurs in nature. And so I, you know... I think we are totally in, in line and in sync. But what I want to help people understand right now is that the core difference between taking this genetically modified approach, doing genetic engineering with CRISPR or the 1.0 version is really different than hybridization. Because even in the case where we are creating fish stock that we think can survive better and we're farming them in open net pens and on our oceans and in our fjords of Nor Norway and everywhere else, we are, even in that case, affecting the viability of wild populations, but not potentially as drastically as some of the other stuff that we do, because we could theoretically stop the farming and let these ecosystems recover, right? We could theoretically shift how we're doing this to do a landlocked approach just to stay with fishing for a minute. Paul Greenberg wrote a book called uh, Four Fish. He argued in that book that we chose the wrong four fish to farm, right? Uh, I think it was bass, cod, salmon, and tuna, right? So we farm these four fish. They don't take to ponds like too well. So farming them in probably not tuna. Probably not tuna. Right. But go ahead. <laughs> so tuna's too big. Farming yeah. them in a location where it's completely separate from the aquatic ocean world is really challenging. They don't survive. And so he argued that we chose the wrong four fish. Like tilapia might have worked all day long, but tilapia is also low in omega-3, so it doesn't get as much popularity around it as a source for the nutrients that we need. Regardless how do we help people understand that the the difference is vast <laughs> i mean I, you've had this conversation so much I, I mean i can hybridize a pluot with a plum and an apricot and it's a new fruit but it's not gmo so how does that yeah, differ you know it's nature has done this experiment for millions of years and sorted out with you know those that eat the food and whatnot as to what's safe and what works when you genetically engineer something you create such damage that like with the bt toxin created in in corn so you have two things going the toxin itself is designed to poke holes in the guts of insects to kill them and you're putting that now into corn and it might be creating leaky gut inside of us so you're adding a gene to make industrial agriculture work better. It's never been part of the human food supply and it might be creating not only leaky gut, which can lead to virtually all diseases, but also it can promote immune responses and create sensitivity to formerly harmless compounds according to research on animals. Now, in addition, the process of inserting that turned on a gene in the corn it produces something called gamazine, which is a known allergen. It's not found in natural corn. You can hybridize and hybridize, but the gamazine gene doesn't turn on, but it does turn on with the genetically engineered variety. So it's something that's new, untested, and 
unlabeled. So if it had been part of nature and we knew that corn can produce allergens, then that would have been something we would have dealt with. Now we're introducing completely new elements. I think the greatest danger comes when you think, what is the most dangerous species to genetically engineer? And the answer is microorganisms. The microbes, as we now know, and I'm sure you've interviewed people about it, turn out to be mission critical for human health and the environment. In terms of human health, perhaps 80% of all diseases can find their source in changes in the microbiome, particularly the gut microbiome. And we're talking about massive numbers, so many that they're really like a second organ, another organ. Now, well, we, we have 37, 30, 37, 39 trillion human cells and at least that much again of bacteria in our body. Yeah. And then there's more viruses and then fungi and yeah. all that. So you, you know, what's interesting we are not, is we are not our, our bodies alone. We are an ecosystem in itself. And when we land blast our microbiome health degrades, this is one of the reasons that we have such out of control uh, hormone issues. And because guess what? Hormones are so affected by your microbiome. And we're just beginning to really understand how much. So all of your metabolic processes. You could even argue that your mitochondria is essentially like one of these. In fact, it looks undiscernible from uh, bacteria. It looks like bacterial a bacteria. DNA. And, and the, under a microscope, it, they're basically like our inborn um, <laughs> biome. And even, even the ones that aren't part of our cells operate together in a symbiogenesis where we outsource up to 90% of our daily metabolic and chemical functions to the microbes living inside us. That's why we can get away as humans with a measly 23,000 genes less than earthworms because we use the 3.5 million genes of the microbes living inside us. And to give you an example of how brilliant the microbe-human interaction is, we know that establishing a healthy microbiome in the gut of an infant is essential for their lifelong health. So how does the microbiome and the human work together to create it? Milk digesting microbes travel to the birth canal in the second trimester, inoculate the infant during the birthing process. The first milk from the breast just takes out all the oxygen in the gut to produce a healthier environment for anaerobic microbes, particularly bifidobacteria. More microbes then come from the breast. More microbes come from the skin of the nipple. If the baby is unhealthy, their sal salivary microbes get fed back to the mother, change the formula until the child is healthy. And a significant amount of the breast milk is completely undigestible by the infant. It's not designed for the infant. It's designed it's to feed the for microbiome. the microbiome, yep. So when we think about that, it's like, oh my God, we had no idea how intricate it is, but it's like that at every level. Soil is even more complex. Not only does it support healthy crops and food and basically the entire ecosystem above the ground, but it sequesters carbon. The algae in the ocean produces most of the world's oxygen. The fungal networks shuttle nutrients between trees. And one of the ways that the microbe is so intelligent is that it kind of swarms DNA. It shares DNA in these big uh, flea market flea swaps. You know, <laughs> they, they share DNA, see what works, and they figure out as a microbiome, which is microbial community, how they can best support their host us or the ecosystem that they live in and how they can best be supported by it. So there's a lot of gene swapping. And this has evolved over millions and billions of years so that the micro Jedi army is the foundation of so much of the ecosystems outside and inside of us. So now you take gene edited microbes and you release them. Maybe you're releasing them on purpose, like Pivot Bio, which has something 
that is on 3 million acres of corn with 5 trillion microbes per acre, and that's not even the biggest GM micro producer, or you have companies that use genetically engineered microbes in factories to produce things that might escape the biggest source of variety of genetically engineered microbes will be high school biology students oh geez because every school unless we do something is going to be equipped with crispr cost less than two thousand dollars to get a lab they will be producing and mass millions of varieties of genetically engineered microbes released every year well this is one of the so big you release problems. The we, we have i'm here in silicon valley and you're close there too right i mean i'm just over the hill in santa cruz county there is incentivization of entrepreneurship in this space so much so that you have novel food sources coming up where you can make a chicken like meat in a petri dish using microbes how many of these are genetically engineered to do that work i would imagine most of them a lot of them when you talk about cultured meat you can do it with or without gmos some are clear that they use a combination of culturing which is a kind of cloning and gene editing mm -hmm. um, and they work together so and both have side effects. I'm not an expert at cloning. So if something is just cultured, it's not my area. Something uses gene editing, I perk up and say, that's a problem. Right. And there's things like Impossible Burger, where they genetically engineer yeast with a gene from the roots of soybean plants. And then in a vat, fermentation vat, it produces something red called leg hemoglobin, mm -hmm. which they then put into the burger. Yeah. They asked the FDA and the Obama administration, can you call this generally recognized as safe? And they said, no way. It's never been in the human food supply. There's no evidence. So they said, we're going we're gonna to feed it to people anyway. Then in the Trump administration, without any additional evidence, the FDA changed its position and said, sure, we'll call it generally recognized as safe. When you look at the animal feeding studies, there's evidence of harm. Moreover, it's not just the leg hemoglobin that was put in. They just scooped up all the proteins in that vat 46 uncharacterized proteins constitute 30% of that slurry, put it into the burger, and people are reporting getting sick from eating it. And there's no surveillance to say if it is in fact the burger. We just know a lot of people are reporting it, but it could be serious problems when they use the similar type of synthetic biology programming in Japan back in the 80s to create L-tryptophan. The process created little micro contaminants that ended up killing about 100 Americans and causing five to 10,000 to fall sick. And we didn't learn the lesson from that. So coming back to the microbes here, imagine that you release a genetically engineered microbe accidentally as a high school student, it might travel the planet, swap its genes into 10,000 different microbes that in turn travel the planet and mutate and swap their genes. So now if you have given a survival advantage, so it does survive and most won't, but if it does survive, it can wreak havoc inside our bodies, outside our bodies. What happens if oxygen isn't producing most of the world? I mean, algae isn't producing most of the world's oxygen. What happens if the soil isn't sequestering carbon? What happens if the microbiome in infants is unsupporting health? All of these things are at risk and any release is untrackable and unfathomable in what it can do. There's a trillion microbes. We've only discovered maybe a thousand, and I mean, maybe 1% of them characterized 1% of the trillion. And every time we discover more about the importance of the microbiome, we're in awe. Mouthwash can cause higher blood pressure because it can kill the microbes in the mouth that produce nitric acid. Oxide. There's so many mind boggling things. The microbes on the skin keep our skin healthy. I can go on and on, but I won't. You get the point. Well, now I understand that... why. What did Mark say when he was introducing you? Oh, be nice. <laughs> be kind to them, Jeffrey. <laughs> All right. All right. Because so no, we're this gonna, is, we're have this to... is, I mean, I don't like to come from a place of fear, but this is some scary shit. And All right. If you want to be, if you want to get the the full alarm, the full wake up call, go to responsibletechnology.org. That's your company. And look at the, right? that's the nonprofit organization, and look at the sixteen minute film called "Don't Let the Gene Out of the Bottle." It describes 
a genetically engineered microbe, which had it been released as planned, could theoretically have ended terrestrial plant life. Another one could have theoretically altered weather patterns. Now, theoretically means it definitely, we can't say it for sure, but it has the, the potential. dots are connectable. Yeah, it has the potential to do that. Right. And that gives you the wake up call. Many people in this world are calling for banning gain of function on potentially pandemic pathogens. That's a good step in my opinion, but it's ignoring biology in that genetically engineering, even common everyday microbes can cause a catastrophe as great as a pandemic. And the film gives an example. So one of my jobs is to wake people up to the dangers and we've got that today. But another one is to craft the solutions. So I've been doing this GMO stuff for 27 years. And the solution there was to create a tipping point of consumer rejection, where you get a small percentage of the population saying, we don't want GMOs. It tips the scales and prevents the massive uh, takeover of GMOs. Monsanto wanted 100% of all commercial seeds genetically engineered and patented by now. There's been about 12. And we were involved in doing that. In this case, we need national laws and international treaties. So we have a program to create a global movement to do just that. And it's not just a movement saying no genetically engineered microbes released. It's a movement of movements. So healthcare practitioners who know the importance of the microbe get on board. So regenerative agriculture that relies on the microbes in the soil get on board for the climate change activists that require carbon drawdown into the soil, they get on board. Environmentalists, ocean preservationists, spiritual organizations that think GMO means God move over. These are the groups that we are going to be rallying and inoculating in popular culture some of the information we talked about and inoculating in academia much more precise and in-depth analyses of what could go wrong. And then taking all of that energy and focusing it on governments for regulations, new laws, and new treaties. And we are in a hurry, as for, for obvious reasons. So we would like to invite people, when you go to responsibletechnology.org and look at Don't Let the Gene Out of the Bottle, you can also watch the six minute animated film Seven reasons why gene editing is dangerous. And I plan to embed these Please. on the blog so that people, even if they just come to the blog page, they can review them because it's absolutely imperative that we spend time on these resources. So I'm not going to risk that they don't make it there. I'll provide that link um, to the blog and then we'll embed them. We'll embed links as well so that you can watch the specific videos. Now, I appreciate Beautiful. where we're headed. Now. Let me let me just finish this one, Karina, one point yeah. here. Because if I fail to mention this, which I've done too many times, <laughs> then we're risking our success. We absolutely need monetary support right now to get this done. It was so much cheaper to focus on consumer choice. We could do it for a few hundred thousand dollars a year and have just so much influence around the world. My books were like bestsellers. The films we created, Secret Ingredients and others, were seen by millions of people. Here, that's not good enough. So if people would, are concerned about this, please make a, a recurring donation to our nonprofit and help us and then share the spread the word, sign up for our newsletter, share what we have with others because we're in a situation that's pretty urgent. We've hit this time in human civilization where we need to make wise choices and not simply allow Bear Monsanto to make the choices for us. Well, I have to tell you, I've had personal experience with geneticists. I even used to live with one in San Carlos who worked for Genentech. And the reality is each of them is incentivized to develop more patents for the master company they work for. They're not all entrepreneurs sitting in the CEO seat, right? So it could be a cauldron full of people that are microbiologists sitting here working on the next big thing. In this case, my roommate was working on a technology to make the skin of fruits more permeable. Gee, how has that been implemented? How has that been used? Or a new way to make vitamin C. And vitamin C is used in so many things, each of these creating huge profit centers. 
And the reality is that today, these baths to fruits are used in all sorts of things to, uh, well, you know, put more pesticides in our environment to genetically engineer things and, and different foods that might find their way on your plate. Now, in addition to going to your site, I want to know how you personally um, are making the wiser choices in your daily life to limit your exposure to genetically engineered bacteria, foods, etc., so that our audience can learn how to stay away from as much of the scary stuff as possible in their personal lives. Well, we recommend eating organic, and there's a reason. It used to be that I said, eat non-GMO, and if you can't eat organic, because then you also avoid these toxic chemicals. And then I learned that Monsanto was encouraging farmers to spray Roundup, not just on the Roundup ready crops, but on the grains and the beans, also in orchards on the ground and vineyards on the ground. And Roundup, which I had studied for many years, turns out to be incredibly nasty. I mean, linked to these diseases we're talking about, foundational damage of human health. And I realized that the way to avoid GMOs and Roundup was not to just eat non-GMO, because if you eat a bowl of oatmeal, oats are sprayed just before harvest with, with glyphosate-based herbicides all over North See, America. I was under the impression that if they were sprayed with glyphosate, that they had to be labeled as GMO or that they couldn't be labeled as non-GMO. And you're telling us that that's not the case. Not the case for sure. That's For terrible. sure. Oats are always non-GMO. There's no genetically engineered oats. It can have the non-GMO project verified butterfly, but it could be swimming in glyphosate like mung beans and chickpeas and lentils. So, and wheat. But there are USDA so, organic um, oat But organic does not oats. allow either GMOs yeah, or Roundup. That's right. So if you go to responsibletechnology.org, we have a database of which foods have been tested and with the levels of glyphosate. You'll see organic in almost every case has either zero or just a tiny amount because it's in the rain and water, it's in the yeah. rain and the air. The water so it can't be zero in all, all right. places. Um, so if you can't eat organic, at least avoid GMOs and avoid those foods that have high levels of glyphosate. We have a list of the GMOs. We have a list of the foods with high levels of glyphosate. So if you can't eat organic, you can use that information to navigate. Well, that's perfect. I really have to say, I appreciate your time and helping us understand that. Now I did get into this whole glyphosate story quite deeply on the Nutrition Without Co Compromise podcast. That episode will likely be out around the same time as this one. So I'll be sure to link the episodes to one another so you can navigate from one to the other with interest. Now, any other silver lining that you can share? So perhaps we can land on a more hopeful note. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You see, we know that individuals who have health issues and sometimes the most serious health issues with the most grave prognoses will hear that prognosis or diagnosis and reevaluate their actions, even their thinking, their relationships, their lifestyle. And that prognosis becomes a blessing, that everything in their lives after that change is a better life. And, and often that can change the nature of the problem altogether. I believe that human consciousness is not linear or local, but can act in an interactive systematic way, systems way. And that we've seen in history, even more so quickly, rapid escalation of new ideas and new frames and new things that we accommodate, new relationships. And I think that this particular threat is unique in that a single person has the potential to damage all living beings and all future generations. There's a level of potential harm in this technology that goes beyond anything we've seen, and it creates this sense of, OMG, we need to do something, and it can inspire a sense of we need to protect microbes, we need to protect the gene pool, we need to protect nature. In that case, 
we are actually entering a new relationship. Now that we have the ability to easily destroy on purpose or by accident, we now have an urgency to protect and to do it not just individually, but to do it as a species. We can't be leaky with our treaties. We can't say all this, all these countries except these three. It's got to be a different viewpoint in terms of humanity and nature. And I think that that is something that will naturally be generated when this threat becomes widely known by a critical number of people all saying the same, we need to protect nature now. And in that sense, when enough people line up with that urgent knowing that like a certain number of iron filings lining up can create a magnet to the whole, I think we're going to see a shift in collective consciousness and that attitude of protecting nature will become commonplace, not just with GMOs. It'll, we've seen this so often, especially with social media, where something is so obscure and rejected, then all of a sudden it becomes obvious. So obvious, like, of course. But it took a certain number of people to get us to the of course. And that's what we're doing, getting to the of course, now that we have hit this time where we can completely end biological evolution as we know it. We need to steward biology, steward the planet, and protect it for future generations. And that, I think, is a huge silver lining. And it's interesting that the pandemic timing is also a weird silver lining because it has alerted everyone that microbes can travel, mutate, and wreak havoc. And it has alerted everyone that genetic engineering and labs can create pathogens that can wreak havoc. And now we're just adding a little bit more saying, okay, any microbe should be protected from being released or it might wreak havoc. And so we're on the precipice of getting what we need and the ripple effect could be greater in all relations between humans and humans and nature. Well, I love that. I think those are marvelous closing words on your part, Jeffrey. I do want to say, I'm, I'm making it real for people here. I personally have chosen to never eat an Impossible Burger because I couldn't believe that it was a regenerative product. I couldn't believe that it was better than eating a regeneratively farmed steak, as a for example. And what is proven out is that they are not reporting on a lot of their carbon measures, that that product itself is not better for the environment. And as you just learned today, it also has genetically engineered components that could also wreak havoc on a system. And so I think certain people need to hear this more than once, that a food that is engineered to look like another food probably doesn't retain all of that natural that we might seek to consume if you're looking at the foodscape. But as we are just talking about, as you're closing here today, Jeffrey, it is so much bigger than that because if we cannot allow for, let's just say, nature to control a little bit of itself, <laughs> then we're going to end up dealing with the repercussions of it in a way that we can't even foresee today. We might be able to depict it in the world of science fiction. We might be able to go back and Oh, I'm going to actually say this. I, um, because of the Soil and Health Forum, Starhawk presented and talked about permaculture. I hadn't thought about her book, The Fifth Sacred Thing, for 30 years. It's over 30 years old, right? I read it when I was in high school. I went back and reread it. And how much of that book was prescient and almost like it predictive? <laughs> it was predictive of some of the future that we've landed in. In that book, she's depicted a, a world in which we might live in 2048. And I feel like that book still stands as a warning for what could come if we do not take more control of building responsible technologies that can help people and planet thrive. And so this is a very big story. I personally am going to make a donation on a recurring basis to your work because I so believe in, in this and in this very thing. I live and work in the natural products industry. I am a climate activist. And I put this podcast out there for everyone to invite you to care more about issues that really matter so we can create a better world. So this is me standing behind the ethos of that show. I stand with Jeffrey 
I am a full believer that GMOs need to be avoided. And there is no way that I'm changing that perspective, given all of the research that I've read and everything that Jeffrey shared today. Do you have any other closing words? I loved how you welcomed the do-gooders. People say, how did I get into this? And I said, well, I was a chronic do-gooder. And then I learned about the incredible dangers, the A-plus urgency of GMOs in that it can affect all living beings and all future generations. And I wasn't, I was just going to help out a little 27 years ago. I don't have a background in science. I'm not a scientist. But just having some skills to bring to the table, we ended up having a huge impact. Mm -hmm. So if people are feeling a whisper inside to step up, I, my slogan is think huge, thinking big is so last century. We have huge issues. And when you step up to take responsibility in a big way, the support that comes from others and from nature herself is remarkable. It's like an advanced technique for personal evolution as you focus on the evolution for all of us. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you. Now, if you can stick around, I'll quickly do the close. To learn more about Jeffrey Smith and his important work with the Institute for Responsible Technology, please visit their website, responsibletechnology.org. As always, I'll provide direct links to Jeffrey, the company he founded, and everything that we discussed today with our expanded show notes. I will also embed the videos that we mentioned. Now, on this website, you will find complete transcripts and additional resources, and you can sign up for the Care More, Be Better newsletter. When you do, you will receive your five-step guide to help organize your activist efforts, including nature and sustainability notes that will help you on your journey. Now, if you loved today's episode, please subscribe and set that bell to notify so that you are alerted when new episodes drop. While you're at it, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you happen to have caught us today. It would help us to reach more people so more people can discover the show. Thank you, listeners and watchers, now and always, for being a part of this pod and this community, because together we really can do so much more. We can care more. We can be better. We can even build better non-GMO solutions that protect our soils and preserve our microbiomes for generations to come. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Care More, Be Better, a podcast for social good. To make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. And share with your friends to help us reach more people and spread more social good.